This is part four of our sessions, and this one is called Reading Analysis. And with this, we come to the last session that we have for you today. Let's take a look at the following information. Have you heard this before? What do these sentences show? Let's take a look at them. The first one says, readers are nerds. People who read do so because they have to. Reading books is a luxury of the time reach. Comics and other books with lots of pictures don't count, and real understanding of a text comes from finding the author's precise meaning. Do you agree or disagree with these sentences? If you agree with these sentences, it's because maybe you have been influenced by the myths around reading. For this case, I don't know if you have previous experience or if you have heard about The Little Prince, a famous book. As you can see over there on the picture on the screen, uh, we have the picture of a baobab which is this huge tree. And in the little prince's planet, uh, we had a lot of these type of trees. And what they were doing was basically to consume the planet itself. So with these myths, what we're doing is the same thing. We're consuming the reading process itself. And we have problems in terms of how we see ourselves as readers, how we see other people as readers, and how we analyze different texts. Let's take a look at these myths. I'm sure that you have heard many more. For the first one, readers are nerds. Um, this doesn't go necessarily hand in hand. Everybody can be a reader, and in fact, all of us, we are readers. Even as Paula mentioned before, if you are reading a graph or a chart or a piece of text, then you are a reader. For the second one, people who read do so because they have to. Even though many people have to read because of their jobs or because of what they are studying or because they need to work on some kind of research project or write a paper, um, there are also other people that read for pleasure. So this is also part of analyzing your relationship with uh, reading. The third one says that re reading a book is a luxury of the time reach. And even though all of us, I think, we are aware that we are kind of running out of times, uh, out of time, uh, that we have a lot of things to do every day in our life, it's a matter of being organized and having some kind of a schedule. If you have a lot of things to do, maybe with just 10 minutes per day, that will be more than enough. Or if you can spend even one hour or two hours a day, so feel free to do that. This is not a matter of time, but a matter of intention and commitment. The other one, comics and other books with lots of pictures don't count. Remember that we have lots and lots of different types of literature. So we have, for example, science fiction and fantasy, dystopias and self-help books and biographies. And guess what? Comics books, comic books are part of this. And then we have the real understanding of a text comes from finding the author's precise meaning. Then my question will be, what was the author's precise meaning? If you are reading just to achieve that, maybe that could be a little bit boring or even too challenging and you might never get to the answer. So my recommendation for this is to create your own text. Uh, many people say that you have a text and every single time that you read it, you create new meaning. So that's what we should look for. Now, around these myths, what do we do with myths? We have to identify them, analyze them, un analyze them understand their causes, and then do something about it. And it's very, very related to the topic of critical thinking, which is the main um, approach that we're going to have for our last session. So on the screen, you can see this picture. It says left-handed whopper by Burger King. So let me tell you a story. For April Fool's Day in 1999, Burger King took a full page adverb uh, in the US today announcing that they had created this new left-handed whopper in which they carefully placed all the ingredients in the hamburger so they didn't spill out of it and it was so much better than just a right-handed whopper and that they were thinking in all their clients. Obviously, this was a prank, but guess what? Thousands and thousands of people came the next day to the restaurants asking for the left-handed Whopper. And they even said that they had a, it had like a better flavor and it was like the best thing that they have eaten in their lives. So my question will be, were they really using critical thinking skills? I don't think so, because the background knowledge was there, but they were just consuming the adverb. They were, no, were, they were not really digesting the information. And I have another example for you. This one is a video, and uh, it's called the Swiss Spaghetti Harvest. A well-respected news program, also for, a, for April's full day, uh, showed Swiss farmers enjoying their spaghetti crops. Let's take a look at this video.
It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here, in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower, at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavour and makes it difficult for him to obtain top prices in world markets. But now these dangers are over and the spaghetti harvest goes forward. Spaghetti cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the tremendous scale of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the vast spaghetti plantations in the Po Valley. For the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. After picking, the spaghetti is laid out to dry in the warm alpine sun. Many people are often puzzled by the fact that spaghetti is produced at such uniform length. But this is the result of many years of patient endeavour by plant breeders who've succeeded in producing the perfect spaghetti. And now the harvest is marked by a traditional meal. Toasts to the new crop are drunk in these pocalinos. And then the waiters enter bearing the ceremonial dish. And it is, of course, spaghetti. Picked earlier in the day, dried in the sun, and so brought fresh from garden to table at the very peak of condition. For those who love this dish, there's nothing like real homegrown spaghetti. Okay, so what do you think about this video? Um, for this case, if you believe the video, maybe it's because you don't have the background knowledge of how um, spaghetti is created in some way. And guess what? Again, thousands and thousands of people were asking for the spaghetti tree and where to get the seeds. Um, so obviously here we can have different factors to analyze. It could be background knowledge that is um, lacking or missing, or just that they are not really analyzing the information as it should be. So as you see, critical thinking is one skill that needs to be nurtured and needs to be practiced every single day. And just as reading, it doesn't come um, naturally. And here you have examples that is not only in written form, but also in ads and even in videos. So let's continue with the concept of critical thinking. So we can see critical thinking as a way to cultivate the mind. Uh, obviously, it's a disciplined process of actively and skillfully uh, conceptualizing, summarizing, analyzing, and evaluating information. Now, if you see, well, if you heard, I said a lot of words over there. So definitely, it depends on the type of text. With some texts, for example, if you're just reading for pleasure, so you can relax. But if you're looking for information, for example, for some kind of research project, and you're looking for data to support your opinions, then you will need to summarize and evaluate the information to see if it's really the one that you need to include, for example, in your research project. And then all this information that you get will be the resource of the result of observation and experience, reflection, reasoning, and hopefully you will be able to communicate it in some way. We also see critical thinking uh, as part of two components. The first one basically is where you have the information, you process it, remember reading with without capital letter. So you just have the text and you process the information in the best way that you can with all the tools that you have at hand. And the second one is when you create a habit out of it. So it's not just analyzing information once or just because I have a purpose, but it comes and it turns part of into part of your routine and basically daily activities. Uh, to do that, you need obviously commitment to have time and to have the intention to do so. So in this way, if we really use critical thinking as an important tool to work individually and also to work as, um, as a member inside a group, that will guide us 
to a different uh, context, uh, into a different situation. In this way, we will not just memorize information that sadly is what we do most of the times. Uh, we don't question the information that we have over there, no follow-up questions, no um, triangulating information to see if research was accurate and if it's appropriate for what I'm doing. I'm just memorizing and that shouldn't be the case. The other one is could be that you have the skills, but maybe you don't know what to do that, with that. Maybe you're very good at summarizing information or organizing it, but you don't know what to do with that. And in the other case would be that maybe you have the skills, you know how to use the skills, but then what do you do with the result? If you don't share that result, if you don't analyze it, then what will be the purpose of it? And the last one is that critical thinking is seen as a lifelong endeavor. We don't have um, we cannot reach a certain point in our lives where we said, when we can say, okay, now I'm perfect at critical thinking. We cannot do that. It's the a process that needs to be nurtured and then in which you need to ask a lot of questions and read and be trained into that. So for that case, what we need to do is um, to see that we cannot be 100% good at it, but we have, as we say, to choose our fights and to choose our battles. So what we can do is, for example, uh, analyze what type of genres I can really use my critical thinking skills and the ones that I need to do that. Uh, so in that case, we will be um, aware of the different blind spots that we can have or our own strengths and weaknesses. What are some stages inside the critical thinking process? Because yes, we can define it. I can give you recommendations to how to do that, but let's analyze because sometimes we do many things that are already part of the stages in the critical thinking process. So for the first one, we have classification. It's very important to first identify the text that we have before in front of us and the characteristics of the genre. It could include visual or written text. Another one is the intention of the author. If it's just to entertain, is it to present arguments, is it to persuade or just to inform? If it's just to inform, I can include that information in my background knowledge. If it's to persuade, then I have to be careful and to analyze the arguments that are given. The other one is the relevance of the vocabulary. You know that vocabulary is extremely, extremely um, useful and also something that you need to pay attention to. Uh, you can convey exactly um, you can have the same intention, but at the end you will convey a different uh, meaning if you use different words. It's not the same to say something is beautiful, something is gorgeous, uh, something is smart, something is interesting. Even though we have synonyms, we also have to be careful of it because every single word has a specific connotation. And with that, we can say that we can analyze the type of text that we can have. Is it formal? If it's informal, what is the semantic meaning that we have inside of it? The other one is the structure of the arguments. How are their sequence? Can I really follow the arguments or are they in presented in a very disorganized way, maybe sometimes even in purpose to kind of confuse the reader? Uh, do I need to prove the information that I have over there? Can I debunk or compromise? Compromise when you say, okay, your arguments are very solid, let's reach like a middle point. Then we have also to work on the validity of the text. Nowadays, with all the easy access that we have to information, thanks to technology, we have lots of sources, but guess what? We also have fake news. So we have to be careful about that. People say if it's online, it's true. Mm -mm, not necessarily. So always analyze the sources. And I have a very simple example for you. For example, Franklin Chan. I know you have heard about him before. Um, he's an es expert on his field of study. But what about if I ask Franklin Chan to talk about maybe teaching or maybe about the use of the dictionary? Even though he's an expert in his field, that doesn't mean that he will be an expert in all the different fields. So that's also part of validating the text and analyzing the information that you have. Then in terms of the explanation, is the explanation well structured? Do I have sounds argu sound arguments that I can easily prove? Um, do I need more information, facts or examples or even experiences? And how can I digest the information? Do I need more tools to do that? And then we have the conclusions. Do I have some sense of wrap up? Okay, do I have more answers than questions at the end? And what I have to do is basically analyze that and it doesn't mean that it's something bad, 
because maybe the author, the intention was to lead to more questions and more inquiring at the end when uh, the text is done and the reading process has finished. So we're going to take a look here at the last part, which is uh, things that you need to focus on, like the, the final recommendations that we have for you. Um, the first one says small parts of the text. Uh, sometimes we focus on the whole text and we want to have like a general overview of it. But if you focus on small parts, you can get all these information that I previously mentioned about uh, the stages in the critical thinking process. The other one, uh, remember that you always have your uh, background knowledge and that's very valuable, either because that will help you construct new meaning or because that will help you to think critically based on what you are um, exposed to. The other one is meaning. You know that the plot, the structures, the characters, the settings, even colors or pictures or graphs are used to provide meaning. And you're the one in charge of, of creating that meaning. And then we have variety. Um, we have lots and lots of interpretation based on what you have experienced, different point of views, values, emotions, actions, and ideas. So sometimes in reading, we cannot say that we have the best answer or the single answer. Just coming back to the first session where um, we talked about um, how impossible it is just to give one definition of reading. These are some, uh, this is the source that we consulted um, to organize all this information for you. And um, here I have this. Think left and think right and think low and think high. Oh, the things that you think up if only you try. So with this information, uh, we come to the last session. We want to say thank you, all of you, for being here with all of us. Uh, we hope that uh, you have learned a lot with this um, information and hope to see you in the future in following sessions. Thank you so much.